Good morning. Hear our call to worship from Psalm 32. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Please stand and sing with us. Brothers and sisters, receive the greeting of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Pray with me, please. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is in your name that we gather. It is in your name that we anticipate to hear a word from you. It's in your name that we long to be sent into the world this week. Send your Holy Spirit upon us that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, that we may hear your word, receive your sacrament, and leave this place restored and renewed in the covenant of your grace, in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Hear this word from God from the psalmist, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin, the Lord, does not count against him, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the waters rise, they will not reach him. That's the hope we have when we come before our God in prayers of confession when they're offered in Jesus' name. And so I invite you in the space before us, there will be a spoken word by me, some silence to name sins before God for him to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, let's come before our God now in the prayer of confession. God, we long for that day when we can truly sing with confidence that you hold over our being absolute sway. We know you're sovereign in all things. You're sovereign in our lives, and yet we, in our freedom, we abuse it. We we abuse your will. We go against your call to live as your image bearers in this world. You've empowered us with everything we need, and so often we fail to love you, to love our neighbor, and to live in creation faithfully. God, we ask that you will hear now these prayers of confession offered to you in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So the psalmist continues in Psalm 32, receive this good news. The psalmist says, you have been my hiding place. You will protect me from all trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. We are a people who have been delivered from our own sins and from the troubles of this world forevermore when Christ returns. Because of Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection, our sins are forgiven, and we can sing songs of deliverance in Jesus' name. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so this morning, uh, kids, you hanging out at home, and for everybody gathered in this place, uh, this morning we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion later on in our service, but that's not the only sacrament that we have. Tad, can you help me out, buddy? So say it nice and loud so I can hear you. So that's the table where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. What do we do over here? In fact, I think the last time we had the sacrament over here, it was for your your baby sister, Etta. So can you remember what this is called over here? What do we do to babies or to adults over here with this bowl? Did I hear something about water? Yeah, pour the water. Let's do that. You walk me through it, all right? So I'm going to pour the water in the bowl. Yeah. Do you, know, do you remember what it's called when we put water on someone's head? Have you, do you remember the word baptism? Yeah. So baptism is where we are reminded that God cleans us from our sins. He promises to do that when we, by faith, believe in Jesus, that he'll cleanse us of our sins. In today's gospel lesson... Jesus is talking with his disciples and he tells them that they are already clean because they have been given his word. That's what Jesus says. And we're going to hear him say some other wonderful things in our gospel lesson too. But he says, you're already clean because I have given you my word. That's what we just did in worship just now. We heard God's word from the psalmist saying that we are clean. That we can sing songs of deliverance in this place Sunday after Sunday 
because of what Jesus has done for us. And in baptism, we celebrate that he forgives us of all of our sins in Jesus' name. Like water washes away dirt from our bodies, Jesus' blood washes away our sin. We don't need to come back Sunday after Sunday and month after month to be baptized again. Ted, you've been baptized. Eddie, you've been baptized. Now, you don't even know what that means yet. And kids out there, many of you have been baptized too. We don't need to come back week and week to be cleansed again because this is a promise God makes to us once and for all that we are his children and we belong to him. And someday we want you to claim those promises that you believe in him and to profess your faith that what God said in baptism you believe deep down inside. And then there's the second sacrament that we come to over here. This is the Lord's table. And so we can do this, we can do this every day. We can do this every week. We can do this every month. That's what we do here at Thornapple Community Church. We celebrate monthly the Lord's, the Lord's Supper to be reminded of what we're told in baptism, that we belong to him. And he wants to remind us time and time again that he loves us so very much that we have bread to remember his death on the cross and his body hanging there and we drink from the cup to be reminded that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of all of our sins and so it's pretty cool how baptism the sacrament of baptism connects to the sacrament of the lord's supper and in this morning's gospel lesson and in the acts lesson we're going to hear how those connect because we're going to hear about someone who gets baptized a man from ethiopia and then in our gospel lesson, we're going to hear how he was called, and we are all called, to continue to live into our baptisms as his followers. And so, I know, Tad, you might not be up here for the sermon, but that's what they're going to hear. But I want you to remember about baptism, and I want you to remember how that connects to the Lord's Supper. We're washed in Jesus' blood. We see that in baptism, and we remember that and celebrate that in the Lord's Supper. And you kids at home, maybe you'll get to hear the sermon, and you can hear how those two connect even more so. I hope you can. Let's pray God's blessing on the rest of our service now. God, thanks that we can be together in this place. Thanks that we can uh, worship you and that we can sing songs of deliverance, uh, that we have been delivered because of your life, your death, and your resurrection. God, help us to believe that more fully this morning and then to live into that truth as you call us to live by faith day in and day out. Thank you for these sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper that remind us who you are and who we are as your beloved children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
word from Acts 8, 26 through verse 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about, pre preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Pray with me. Lord, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Jesus Christ, the risen one, be our single concern. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Biblical accounts like this one always make me wonder. I'd, I'd like for Paul Harvey, the, the legendary radio broadcaster, to come alongside us and tell us the rest of the story. I'd like to know what happened to all those men and women and children that Jesus came across and healed during his public ministry. I'd like to know what happened to them after their encounter with Jesus. I mean, how did the paralyzed man use his newfound mobility? How did the woman who was bleeding for, for nearly two decades spend her extra energy? How did Lazarus, the man that Jesus raised from the dead, seize the rest of his days by, giving, by receiving more of them? Or how about Bartimaeus, the guy that we spent our Lenten journey with, walking with him from Jericho to Jerusalem as he could now see everything that Jesus was doing in Jerusalem? How, how did that go for Bartimaeus? What did he see Jesus do? And how did it go for Bartimaeus as he journeyed with Jesus even after his death and resurrection? I'd also like to know what happened with this Ethiopian eunuch. What became of this guy after he and Philip came up out of the waters of his baptism? As with just about every person that Jesus encountered in the gospel lessons, we just don't know what became of this eunuch. The New Testament is chock full of stories of folks who, who get touched by Jesus either in healing or in forgiveness or in some kind of other spiritual transformation and then later by his apostles and then they simply disappear into the annals of church history. Perhaps one of the best uh, 
movies of World War II, at least in my opinion, was Steven Spielberg saving Private Ryan. In the story, a squadron of soldiers is dispatched across France after D-Day to, to go lo locate Private James Ryan. All four of Private Ryan's had already been killed in World War II, and so the general decides that this one remaining son needed to go home to his mother so that she didn't have to grieve him too. In the course of saving this one man, though, most of the rescue squad is killed along the way. At the end of the film, as the squad's leader, Captain Miller himself, is dying too, he looks at Private Ryan full in the face and he says, earn this, earn this. But how can he? How can a person who can earn something that he's already been given? He can't. It was a gift that he couldn't earn before he got it, and he, he certainly couldn't earn it after he had already received it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about earning something after you already have it. I mean, that's why we give paychecks to people after they have put in their couple weeks of work. We don't pay them before they work. Before they work, we don't put it in the bank. But the idea that Captain Miller was trying to get across here and, and say to Private Ryan was that he now needed to lead a full life because of what he had just been given. The experience of the other soldiers' sacrifice along the way for the good of Private Ryan and for his mother was, was to be so great to alter the rest of his life, the course of his life they wanted to look different because of what he had just received. Maybe he could earn it. Maybe he could be worthy of it after all. The sign and seal of God's grace in Jesus Christ that we encounter in the waters of baptism is like that. It was like it for the Ethiopian eunuch when he went down with Philip into that water, and it's like that for all of us, whether it's at a font or a body of water someplace else. The person who gets baptized, whether an infant, a child, or an adult, does not get baptized because he or she has earned it or because they have attained some level of understanding so as to make it permissible for them to now be baptized. Because baptism is not the end of a process. It's not the end result of a process, but the sign and seal of an invisible gift from God that begins a long process. Or, in the words of Eugene Peterson, it begins a long obedience in the same direction. After baptism, everything we do should begin to demonstrate that we in some way get it. We don't really earn our baptisms, but we live in such a way that we demonstrate that we know full well what the man Jesus, the one who did earn our baptism, who did earn our baptism and our forgiveness of sins and our deliverance and salvation by what, we, what He went through on the cross and in the empty tomb. It's already been earned for us. We have been baptized into Christ's death. And like Christ, we have been raised in baptism to new life in Jesus Christ. We don't need to do anything for it. We simply need to receive the promises by faith in Jesus Christ. We don't know the rest of the story. We don't know the rest of the story of the Ethiopian eunuch fully. But I do think we know something. I think we can very safely assume what Jesus wanted this man to know as he continued his journey of faith. We know what Jesus wanted Bartimaeus to know as he too continued his journey of faith after Jesus' death and after his resurrection. And I think we know what he wants from us too. He wants those of us who have been baptized into his name and follow him as Lord and Savior to know what he makes very, very clear in John chapter 15 to everyone who is in him. That's the gospel lesson that corresponds to this lesson from Acts chapter 8. Let's listen together now to Jesus' words in this good news. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me 
and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he can bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The big lesson Jesus has for his followers, for those of us who, like the Ethiopian, have took the plunge. We've taken the plunge by faith. We believe that Jesus died for us. We believe that Jesus on the third day was raised to new life for us, and we believe the other great mystery of the faith, that Jesus Christ is coming again to make all things new. We have just learned the mystery of what it means to be in Jesus Christ and what our faith boils down to in one single word, and that word is remain. Did you notice how many times Jesus used that word just now in John chapter 15? Eight times in eight verses. When the Bible repeats itself and when Jesus says things over and over again, we need to listen because he's trying to tell us something. Jesus wants us to remain. To remain means to abide. It means to dwell. It means to hold on to. It means to to make your home in. Interestingly, in verse 4, when Jesus says, remain in me, Abide in me. Hold on to me. Dwell in me. It's not an invitation. It's a command. It's a must. It's one of Jesus' non-negotiables. Not, would you like to remain in me? But, remain in me. Have you ever heard anyone speak about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Just so you know, the Bible never actually uses that exact sort of language. The Bible never says in so many words anything about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. However, it's a very good evangelical way of saying what Jesus is saying here in John chapter 15. Remain in me. He's commanding those of us who follow Him, those of us who call ourselves Christians, to be in relationship with Him, to be united to Him, to be connected to Him so down deep in our souls that we don't dry up and wither from the inside out. If you asked me to define what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, someone who's taken a dip into His grace in His life, death, and resurrection, and like the Ethiopian eunuch, has come back out of those waters of baptism, what does it mean to be a Christian? I would say this. A Christian is a person who is in Christ. In baptism, we discover that truth, that we are in Christ Jesus, in His death, in His resurrection, and all the covenantal promises that God fulfilled in His life, death, and resurrection. We are in Christ Jesus and... It remain, and we remain in Christ Jesus. A Christian is a person who is in Christ and remains in Christ, whose life is connected to Jesus in such a way that their lives begin to bear fruit and nourish the entire world all around them. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If a person remains in me, and I in them, they will bear much fruit. If there's one thing that the sacraments teach us about our God, the same lesson from the font to the table and throughout Scripture, it's this. Our God is an abiding God. Our God is a God who remains with us. He dwells with us. He makes His home 
with us. He longs to be connected to us so deeply that we can't even imagine. The Bible is a story of a God who comes to His people. He comes to His people even before sin. He longs to walk with them in the cool of the day in the garden. And then when sin goes to hell in a handbasket because of our sin, Jesus comes into this world as God in the flesh to once again secure for us an eternity of paradise with Him forevermore. Our God longs to be with us. The font and the table communicate a God who wants to abide with us. A God who does abide with us through the gift of the Holy Spirit every moment of our lives. Our God is an abiding God. God remains with us. And He gives us today the bread and the cup to nourish our faith. We believe that Jesus is the host at this table. He is the one who invites us to come to receive His body, to receive His blood by the gift of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, that He actually wants to commune with us, to abide with us. And we come to the table because we want to abide with Him. We want to dwell with Him. We want to remain in Christ Jesus. And so we come to this table. We take the bread and take the cup and we eat and we drink so that we can do our part to abide with God in Jesus Christ. You see, it works both ways. We have a God who longs to be with us and we are a people who have been created with a longing to be with God. And St. Augustine said that we're going to be restless. We're going to be restless until we recognize that we are to abide in God alone. Our souls are restless until we understand that our true home is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we try to fill it with so many other things during the week, don't we? We try to fill it with our work. We try to fill it with all kinds of wonderful good things in God's creation, but all those good things just keep coming up just a little bit short. They're not quite enough, or we need a little bit more the next time. When we come to this table, we receive God's gift in its fullness to communicate to us once again that we have a God who longs to abide with us, and we come to the table to remain in Him. We have an abiding God, and He calls us to be an abiding people. And so we come once again to be nourished because He is the vine in whom we must abide if we're going to go out this week and bear any fruit. We remain not only for our sakes, we remain in Christ for the sake of this whole world. That's the gift of the table. That's the gift of Jesus. He has given us the fruit of His salvation. And He calls us to receive it unto ourselves so that we too can be full of life and full of fruit. Things like faith and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. Those are the sorts of things that should be hanging from the branches of our lives this week. We are in Christ Jesus by faith. We are commanded to remain in Christ Jesus by study of His Word by prayerful communion, and by gathering at the table to be reminded all over again of who and whose we are. Beloved children, called to go and show the world that we are His disciples. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, by Your Holy Spirit, Convict us of this word. Convict us, O God, that unless we remain in you, we will bear no fruit. And that we will not be able to show ourselves to the world as your disciples. Transform us by your word and Holy Spirit so that we can bear fruit this week for the transformation of this world and of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. going to invite you right now to just be aware of your communion elements. So if you at home have them, you can get them ready. If anyone has not received communion elements, you can kind of indicate that by kind of looking back towards Adam Parlberg, Elder Adams in the back. He'll bring you elements if you have not received them already. You can do so right now. I'm not seeing anybody, so good. So it's just a simple envelope. You can... um, Slide it simply right out or 
dump it right out into your hand and the tops of the cup will pop off easy for you too when we get to that point. The Lord's Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come to this table to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death on a cross. By his birth, life, death, and resurrection, Christ has obtained for us a new and everlasting covenant of grace and reconciliation that we will never be rejected by God, but always be accepted of God. We also come to this table to commune with that same Christ who promises to be with us always to the very end of the age. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the bread that nourishes us to eternal life. And in the cup of blessing, he makes himself known to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear any fruit. And we also come to this table in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast of love of which we all shall be a part when Christ's kingdom has fully come and when with unveiled faces we will behold him and be made like unto him in his glory. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. This morning, all of you who have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and who confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you are welcome at the Lord's table. And also with you, we lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. resurrection and of everlasting life, you pour out the cup of your abundance to give us eternal joy in you. And so we gladly thank you with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing the hymn of your unending praise. Holy, holy, holy Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven heaven and and earth earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Transforming God. Your son took the ordinary substance of human flesh and bone. And on his last night with his friends, he took the ordinary materials of bread and wine. Come among us now and make the ordinariness of our lives glow with the wonder of your eternal life. Take these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died, Christ Christ is risen, risen. Christ Christ will will come come again. again. Companionable God, You turn word into flesh, and your perfect love casts out our fear. You show us a way to love you by giving us brothers and sisters to love as we love you. Abide with all those whose lives are far from fruitful. Remain with those who have experienced pruning. Dwell with any who feel like branches that have been discarded. Unite your whole church living and departing, as branches of your one vine, and through being rooted and grounded in you, make us fruitful in body, mind, and spirit, until we stand before you 
with your whole creation, and you are all in all, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On that night, when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this and remember. In the same way, after they had eaten supper, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it, he said to his disciples, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For God's great salvation, I invite you to stand and join in song as we give thanks to God for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's stand to sing. these flowers for us to remember him by. I've been out. Okay, now can you hear me? Testing, one, two. All right, thank you. So flowers, welcome. Flowers are from, uh, to celebrate Chuck's life. Our grace team has, uh, is um, part of our ministry, our All Abilities Team ministry. So like the Whitney House team, the grace team is being formed. There are already four members on this team. Um, Dave Graham and Kim Peckham, Stan Grunsky and Stephen Exo. We need two more people, uh, or, or four, to kind of round out that team. Our hope is that uh, those names would uh, be gathered. Let me tell you just briefly um, what that team will do. They'll celebrate the birthdays of the six men who live at Grace House by providing cake and ice cream. 
you'll um, organize four to six events throughout the year that are kind of social events, um, whether that's going out and going bowling or um, going to a ball game, um, having a picnic. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned last week, they wanted to do a metal detector hunt. Um, so uh, all I can say is uh, this is um, maybe averages two hours a month of anyone's time. Don't let uh, the feeling like you'd be overcommitted uh, prevent you from, from saying yes. And if you're interested, see Dave, Graham, or myself. Some updates before we head into prayer. Colin and Allie um, Hoogerworth welcomed a new son, Elliot Wendell, on Friday, so we celebrate that for them. Jim Tellum's service is this Saturday with visitation from 10 to 10.45, and the service will begin at 11 o'clock. Fonda Parlberg had her hip replacement surgery. It went well. Uh, she's feeling well. Um, I'm sure we'll see her soon. Uh, Rhonda Merlin has her hip replacement surgery tomorrow, and we pray for the same success and well-being for Rhonda. You also need to know that Stan had his um, all right, uh, cardio aversion um, on Monday, I believe it was, and that's for AFib, and after they perform that procedure, uh, he's doing very well. And so uh, further procedures um, look like at this point that he won't need them. Let us come before God in prayer. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us at your table, grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints. We offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. We remember before you all in need of healing and comfort for Fonda Parlberg, Rhonda Merlin, John Beale, Lucini Rodriguez, Yvonne Allen, Nico Vilkins, Stan Grunsky, and Nancy Myers. We celebrate the birth of Elliot and pray your blessings upon Colin, Allie, and Micah as they welcome him into their home. And we pray for Faye Tellum and her family in their grief and for all who are grieving the loss of those they love. O Lord of Providence, who holds the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country, inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders, that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness, so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O Savior God, look upon your church and its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness, bring an end to its unhappy divisions, and scatter its fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage, strengthen its faith, and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, Send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
fed with holy food through God's word, through the nourishment of the sacrament. Go into the world and abide in Christ. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with each of you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>